Hi, everyone, um, and thank you so much for joining us. I think we're going to give everybody about another minute or two to join, and then we'll get started. Um, and we promise not to run over time today, but we wanted to give a couple more people a few minutes to log in. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you, to, thank you for joining us today for our Masterclass webinar. My name is Kelly Chopra, and I am the Business Development Manager here at UWorld. We wanted to borrow a few moments of your time today to help you understand how to get the most out of your UWorld question bank. You are in for a fantastic webinar today. You will not only learn from Dr. Simone Cantola, one of our lead physician authors here at UWorld, but also from our partners at Elite Medical Prep. Most of you probably are familiar with both UWorld and Elite Medical Prep. Elite Medical Prep is an organization that specializes in tutoring medical students for both the USMLE and COMLEX, as well as the shelf exam. They have worked with thousands of medical students throughout the US, Caribbean, and many other countries. Today, we are lucky to have Dr. Marcel Bruce Raymer and Dr. Ken Rubin um, here representing medical elite medical prep. After both presentations, we will open the webinar to Q&A. Should you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. We will try to work through as many questions as possible. We are so excited that you all are here and joining us today. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Simone Cantola to get you started with taking you on a tour through the UWorld Question Bank. Well, thank you, Kelly, and hi, everybody. Um, as Kelly mentioned, I'm on the physician team at UWorld, and our team has uh, physicians from nearly every specialty, um, but my particular background is in plastic and reconstructive surgery, and now I contribute to the surgery and anatomy curriculum at UWorld. A little background for those of you who are meeting UWorld for the first time. Um, for the last decade or two, the vast majority of medical students in the U.S. have been using UWorld to prepare for their Step 1 exams. And the results of that have been great. Um, not only did the using the QBank improve their scores on Step 1, back when Step 1 was scored, but students gave us overwhelming positive feedback about the QBank. Um, they would say things like, I never really understood your this concept until I read your explanation, or I never really put all the pieces together until I had to do your questions. And so what students discovered as they used our QBank was that UWorld wasn't just a test prep product, it was also a learning product. And this masterclass today is about how to use the UWorld QBank as a learning product alongside your preclinical classes so you can master all of that information 
as well as for more concentrated step one preparation when that time comes. So here's a question we get all the time. How should I study? It's a great question. I'm gonna start by talking about the big picture. So a tried and true strategy that has helped countless medical students succeed. And then after that, I'll dive into the QBank and show you how its features can be used to achieve the strategy. This is the main takeaway I'm gonna give you. Start early, practice often, and aim for two times through the QBank. So what exactly does that look like in practice? We recommend a two times through approach that has two different phases. I like to call them the tortoise phase and the hare phase, um, kind of thinking back to Aesop's fable. So in that story, there was a race between the two animals. The hare overestimated his abilities. He ran ahead, took a nap, and ultimately he lost the race to the tortoise who kept plodding along, ditto, ditto, slow and steady. And from that, we get the idiom, slow and steady wins the race, which really is true. You know, in your M1 and M2 years, you need to get through all of that information, slow and steady and consistent to learn it all. But we think you also need to learn to be the hare when it comes time to taking your exams. You're gonna need speed. And additionally, you're gonna need stamina. So we recommend that you work through the QBank in two different phases, trying to get through twice. So the tortoise phase, is during your M1 and M2 years. You take a systems-based approach, um, kind of going alongside your curriculum, slow and steady. You're not worrying about how quickly you're answering the questions. You're really focusing on understanding, building your foundation of knowledge. As you get through that first pass, you're gonna get some self-diagnostics. That'll help you know what things come more easily to you, what things are challenging. You'll have all that data when you go into your dedicated study time. That's when you take your hair phase, which is a test-based approach. You're gonna be now concerned about speed. You need to answer those questions in the time allotted by the NBME exam, which is 90 seconds per question. And you're also gonna be working on stamina. That is being able to take lots of questions back to back to back, like the exam. So you're simulating the exam at this point. You're gonna be doing comprehensive review and going back and working on some of those more challenging areas. So next I'm gonna dive into the QBank itself, but I want you to keep this slide in mind because I'm gonna be referring back to it throughout the talk. So there are lots of ways that you can use the QBank to customize your practice. The first is with practice tests. So practice tests are sort of the functional unit of the QBank and multiple options are available to be able to customize the test to what you need. The first is the test mode. So the tutor mode, if it's on, is gonna show you your explanation right after you answer the question. So you're gonna to wanna to have that on during your tortoise phase when you're building that foundation of knowledge. You'll be getting immediate feedback. Did you get the question right? Did you get it wrong? Why? Um, that's gonna help you understand. You're gonna to wanna to probably turn it off though when you're in your exam simulation period in that hair mode. Um, that's gonna allow you to see the questions back to back to back all in one block and that's gonna simulate the exam. The times mode, when it's turned on, will give you 90 seconds per question, uh, just like the NBME does. You'll probably wanna leave that off um, during your tortoise mode because you're gonna be taking it slow and steady. It doesn't matter how fast you answer the question as long as you understand, but you're gonna to wanna to turn it on anytime you wanna simulate an exam. The next thing you're gonna select is what questions are gonna populate your exam. So unused questions is probably gonna be your default as you're working through the QBank the first time. Um, let's say alongside your classes, check that. But then like, let's say you're approaching your class exams. Um, you may want to go back and make a test just based on the questions that you answered incorrectly. Or you can mark questions as you're working through the practice tests. So say something is challenging for you. Um, if you mark it, then it won't matter whether you got it right or wrong, you'll be able to return to it because we kind of know that sometimes we answer something right, but not for the right reasons. So if you mark it, that can be a way that you can signal the questions that are difficult for you. And you'll always have the opportunity to return to all of the questions. Let's say if you wanna do two passes um, while you're in your system block, but you know, one pass as you're going through and then another pass like right before your class exam. Next, you're gonna select what subjects and systems um, you want to include on the practice test. 
So the subjects, you can see the systems, these were created initially to parallel the NVMe content outline, but it's really easy to use them to customize your test to match your curriculum. So I'm gonna show you how. Um, first, I wanna point out in the upper left of systems, there are some general principles. So a lot of schools will have a foundations block at the very beginning of the M1 year, and that will sometimes cover things like microbiology, genetics, biochemistry. Um, so these questions are kind of designated for those uh, early weeks of medical school. I mean, they're good anytime, but often that's kind of what you're studying those first couple of weeks. Then for the rest of your M1 and M2 years, often you're going through um, in organ system blocks. So this is an example of a preclinical curriculum. Um, the order of the particular system blocks may be different at your school, obviously, but most schools are going to get through these general organ systems. So say you're on your circulation and breathing module, starting with circulation. You would select all subjects and then go to the cardiovascular system. You'll notice there's a bubble that has the number 422. That's the number of questions that are available in the cardiovascular system. So what we'd recommend is that at the beginning of that block, you take 422 and divide it by the number of weeks that you're gonna be studying the cardiovascular system. And then you'll know how to work through it um, by the time you get to your exam. As far as the order in which you see the questions, if you click on that plus sign, you can expand the cardiovascular system to see its categories. So then you can walk through them in the order in which you're covering them. So let's say your, your school starts with the normal structure and function and congenital heart disease. You can answer those questions first. And then maybe you move on to peripheral vascular disease and hypertension and then move on to things that are kind of more isolated to the heart um, and so forth. You can walk through these questions um, so that they kind of really accompany what you're learning in class to help you master uh, that material. And then when you move on to breathing, again, select all subjects, select the pulmonary and critical care system, and you'll have categories of questions that you can work through alongside that particular block. So we really recommend working through this alongside your curriculum because we think it's much higher yield than just rereading a textbook or watching a lecture for a second time because doing the questions is active learning, not passive review. So it's forcing your brain to figure out whether you really truly understand the material. And that deep understanding of the material is gonna benefit you for both your classes and for step one. And Spoiler alert, also for step two and step three, because it appears that those exams are incorporating more basic science now that step one has gone past fail. And then of course, it's gonna help you for your professional career since basic science really is the foundation that clinical medicine is built upon. A final way that you can customize your practice test is by choosing the number of questions. So 40 questions is the max allowed. Um, that's the number per block on the NBME exam. So when you're wanting to simulate the exam uh, during that second phase of learning, the hair mode um, phase, then you're gonna to wanna to do 40 questions um, and turn tutor mode off so that you do those questions back to back to back. But during your learning phase, you, know, you can do a test that's five questions or 10 questions and you can download UWorld and use it on the go um, on your phone, on your tablet. So you can do a bite-sized test um, when you just have a little bit of downtime. So next we're going to dive into the questions and explanations and as one of the content authors, I think I can give you a little bit of a peek behind the curtain into why they're so helpful. So the first thing you'll notice about this question, which is just a pretty typical question, is that it's in clinical vignette form and it's testing a basic science concept, but we're giving you sort of the clinical context for it. And we do that for two reasons. The first is that the NBME uses clinical vignettes, so you're going to be need to be used to seeing it this way. Um, and the second is, again, because it really reinforces that basic science concepts underlie your future patient care. So we'll, we're gonna walk through this question. <clears throat> so in this question, we have a 34 year old woman coming in for a TB evaluation. And she's coming in because she was exposed to active pulmonary tuber tuberculosis in her father. So she has an initial skin test and the results of that are negative. Then she comes back eight weeks later 
and she's feeling healthy, she has no symptoms, but she gets a repeat skin test and that shows skin induration. Um, and so it's a positive test. Her chest X-ray is normal. The question is, which of the following immune effector cells are most important for control of the pathogen, that is tuberculosis, that's responsible for a positive skin test? So you're gonna think about your answer, um, think back to your classes, submit your answer, and if you're in tutor mode, you will immediately see whether you answered correctly or incorrectly, the percentage of students that answered the question correctly, and how long you spent on the question. Now, regardless of whether you answered correctly or not, we strongly recommend that you read the entire explanation because that's really where a lot of the learning is gonna be found. So here's the explanation for this particular question. Um, on the left, you kind of see the, the overview. You'll see that there's an illustration and there's a written explanation. So we try to include an illustration or a table or a clinical or radiographic image um, with the majority of our explanations. And illustrations in particular are good for learning um, because most of us, the stats would show, are visual learners. And we create these illustrations here in-house, um, collaborating between the physician team and our in-house medical illustrators. And our goal is always to try to distill down the high yield information and make it visually appealing. So this particular illustration is showing the immune response all the way from the time the contaminated droplets are inhaled to when they're either killed or walled off. And we're showing all of the critical immune cells that are involved in that process. We're gonna highlight the same information in the written explanation. So there'll be an explanation of the correct answer. There'll be explanations for all of the incorrect answer choices and then an educational objective. Um, and that's a two to three sentence summary of the high points of the explanation. So, Typical attributes of a UWorld explanation, um, since I help write and review these. So they have to be concise and stick to one theme. So this particular question is one of like 25 questions or more that are on tuberculosis in the step one bank. This particular question is just sticking to which immune cells help control TB. But we'll have other questions that are about recognizing the characteristic histologic findings or about reactivation or disseminated TB or the side effects of the medications that are used to control TB. And together, all of those questions are gonna cover everything a student needs to know about TB. But we're gonna break down those big topics into bite-sized pieces so you can progressively master them. The other thing you'll notice is that um, we use what I like to call the triple tell method. So we're gonna tell you the correct answer three times and that subtle repetition is gonna help solidify the information, but it's not really gonna feel redundant. So the first time we tell you is in the explanation of the correct answer choice. The next time is gonna be through the use of strategic bolding. So if we read the bolding here, mycobacterium tuberculosis, interleukin 12, naive CD4 cells, interferon gamma, activation of macrophages. Um, those are really kind of the high points um, for the objective for this particular question. And then next, we're gonna tell you through the educational objective, which is that two to three sentence summary. Okay, let's jump into another question, um, just so you can see a little bit of the variety. In this particular question, we have a patient with sudden chest tightness and shortness of breath. And let's see, he's got a history of prostate cancer. And then we're showing you his chest CT, which has a critical finding. Um, he has a saddle pulmonary embolus. The question asks, which of the following factors most likely contributed to this patient's current condition? So hypercoagulability is the right answer. In this particular explanation, we're gonna be labeling um, the radiology because we know that even though some of you are budding radiologists, you know you're not radiologists yet. So you need to, to be able to recognize what all of the anatomy is, what all the critical um, features are. In the wrong answer choices, um, we're gonna show you the same imaging modality, so chest CT, whenever possible. And this allows you to compare back and forth. So you start to kind of get a handle on what chest CT uh, looks like for these different conditions. Again, we're going to try to keep the learning bite-sized, so we're not going to be putting links to MRI and x-ray in the same explanation, 
uh, even though we will feature x-rays and MRIs and other questions. But again, we're trying to do progressive mastery without overwhelming you. So um, within our QBank, we have radiology, we have histology, gross pathology, clinical images. And I just like to point out that we source these from radiologists, pathologists, clinicians, um, so that you're not going to see these images anywhere else. So that's helpful because when you're taking our questions, you're not going to recognize the images from your textbook or from the web. So to be fresh, um, I don't want to make it too easy, right? As you're going through, like let's say during that first pass, we recommend that you take advantage of the flashcards feature. So you can take any of our written information, visual uh, information, and uh, make custom flashcards tailored for what you need to review. So yes, there are premium decks out there, but they often have thousands of flashcards and not all of them may be specific to what you need to know and what you need to review. And we really believe that time is a precious resource. So we wanna give you the ability to make your own custom flashcards. And then from within QBank, you can study them with space repetition. So one stop shop. Um, the browse tab is gonna allow you to just kind of go through them and edit them. And then the study feature, you can see here has space repetition. So when you answer the question, you say how hard it was for you. And then based on that, you're gonna see it either sooner or later. So you're gonna see things that are difficult more frequently until you master them. And then things that come easier, we're gonna space that out. So it really challenges your long-term memory to retain these uh, bits of information. We also have a feature called My Notebook. Um, it allows you to create an electronic notebook with any of the visual or written material again, and you can customize it um, to what you need. You can you know, also enter things in as you're in your classes or going through other study materials. Um, so flashcards, My Notebook, kind of up to you, but it's really nice to be able to customize um, the info that you want to study again during your second pass. Um, so doing this as you go through your first pass is what we recommend. As you work through the QBank, um, your dashboard is going to show you your progress and your performance. Um, down at the bottom right, you can see the average amount of time that you spent. Again, in your first pass, don't really worry about that. Um, in your second pass through the QBank, that's when you're going to want that to be 90 seconds or less. So most students will, you know, do their first pass during their M1 and M2 years, look at all of their diagnostics, and then reset the QBank before going into their second pass. That way you'll get fresh statistics. These are the diagnostics here. Basically, you can break down your performance via subject. Within each subject, you can break it down um, into the systems. Within systems, you'll also have categories. So let's recap. How should I study? Well, we recommend that you start early and practice often and aim for two times through the QBank. That first time, alongside your classes in a slow and steady fashion, uh, really building that foundation of knowledge, um, maybe creating custom flashcards or my notebook so that information is ready for you to review during your dedicated study time. That's gonna help you master your classes. And you'll also be much more prepared when it comes to dedicated studying for step one. During dedicated in your second pass, uh, work on speed and stamina, that's gonna provide exam simulation for you. I also want to mention dedicated time is when you'll want to do um, the simulation exams. Those are two exams uh, that we have that have four blocks of 40 questions each. Those are separate questions from the main QBank, and you'll want to work through those during your dedicated study time. So sometimes students will ask us sort of a recommended study plan. We put these up here so that you get a sense of about how many questions per week it breaks down to since there are over 3,600 questions right now in the step one QBank, and that doesn't include those simulation exams. So you can look at these numbers and kind of see that the sooner you start, the more manageable it's gonna to be to get through those questions per week. Okay, that wraps up my portion. And um, now let's hand it over to our friends at Elite Medical Prep. Hi everybody, um, thanks again for having us. I'm just gonna share my screen. And we will pick off, 
up right up where we left off, Dr. Cantola. So I'm Dr. Bruce Raymer. Um, as was mentioned, I was introduced earlier by uh, Kelly Chopra at UWorld. I'm a practicing radiologist. I uh, actually do neuroradiology and emergency radiology. Um, and we'll be talking more about elite medical prep. I also have with me my colleague we're lucky to have today, Dr. Ken Rubin. He helped co-found elite medical prep, and he's going to be helping us out during the Q&A, which we're going to leave a lot of time for at the end. So uh, uh, please post your questions, which we've been getting some great fun so far, into the Q&A, and we will answer them uh, at the end of this end of this, this talk. So I wanted to just to briefly uh, mention about elite medical prep. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Dr. Bruce Raymer, and I helped found Elite Medical Prep, and it's an organization that specializes in tutoring for the Comlex, the USMLE, as well as shelf exams. We also have tutoring services for the MCAT. We also do post-residency uh, exams that relate to board uh, certification and a couple of specialties. And our team is comprised of highly trained MDs and MD candidates in numerous specialties. So much like you, we have a very diverse group of, of, of uh, medical people uh, working on our team. Um, and we work with students throughout the U.S., throughout the Caribbean, and also several foreign countries. We also partner with a number of medical schools, including Mount Sinai, UNLV, and several other ones that are listed on this slide. Um, we do different courses for them that are customized to their needs, including tutoring-based programs. So at Elite Medical Prep, we really emphasize active learning. And that's one of the reasons why we're presenting here today with UWorld, because UWorld is one of the fundamental active learning resources. And as you can see on this pyramid, on this, this slide here, we've organized the major types of learning resources into a pyramid from active resources at the base to less active resources at the, at the tip. And active learning resources such as question banks, of course, UWorld is the best example of that. Um, and, and the review of those questions, that is really the foundation of learning. And that's why we put it at the foundation of our, of our pyramid here. Um, flashcards, which are now integrated into UWorld, are also an active resource, and they should be emphasized over less active resources. So when you're thinking about studying, you want to favor the active resources over the less active ones. Conversely, the less active resources that are near the top of this pyramid should be used more sparingly because they've been shown that they're less efficient for review when preparing for test day, and also just generally for study, you know, as I'll show you in a, in a slide or two. Um, when you consider this, Consider this. This is, some of, this is something quite different from the more traditional way of what we were taught to learn, where we would first read and repeatedly read, and then only then get to practice questions. Now, what does the science say about this? Well, we know what we know from the learning science is that starting early with active learning techniques is really key. Um, it helps with stress management if you regularly include cue banks into your daily and weekly routine. You want to start using cue bank so that you can have lots of time to comfortably complete the entire cue bank at least two times through. That's the idea is go through it in one full time and then again. And you're gonna hear this two, two passes going through two times, a lot of, a lot of times, and it's repeated over and over. Um, in an experiment, and this slide shows the summary of that, experiment with medical residents, researchers found that regular testing rather than reading led to a significant increase in knowledge retention six months after the initial teaching session. And that was a pretty significant effect, um, both in magnitude and statistical uh, significance. And with studying alone, meaning just, just reading and just doing passive techniques, the rate of forgetting was quite rapid um, when you're trying to master new material. Generally, it's about 74% of, of the material that you mask, that you read and learn initially is going to be forgotten in about six months. However, when you use active question, when you have active question use, that significant that forgetting process is significantly decreased. So it diminishes the forgetting effect. So the bottom line here is if you're going to spend time studying early in med school, you'll forget significantly more if you use those passive te techniques we showed you at the top of the pyramid, and you will retain so much more if you use the active techniques such as a cue bank. Of course, you will is a great example of that. So really, the, the, you really want to stick with this. And then just to emphasize that, as we note on the slide, the effect of using QBank is emphasized even further when you when you do the questions and then review them with, with the explanations. And of course, your old explanations are legendary. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it's, why it's been such a on QBank. So it's important when we're thinking about starting early, like using the right frame of mind. So what we want to do is we want to consider as medical students and, and also as physicians, why are we taking all these, these uh, standardized exams? So it can be easy just to, to view these exams something you just need to get through. But you can also think of these tests as preparation, uh, as a preparation opportunity to prepare yourself for like the clinical challenges that are going to lay ahead and also the academic challenges. And really what ultimately makes you a true professional is a commitment to continuously improve and prepare. Testing yourself is really one of the most efficient ways to do that. Remember, this is going to be a very long journey and you are likely just at the beginning of that, of that, of that journey at this point, uh, and you're gonna continue your training and learning throughout. So what we talked about 
using a cue bank in a longitudinal fashion, and we're, what we're trying to mention is you make it a habit, is, is how actually do that. So I want to bring up a couple suggestions of tips of how to actually do that. So one of the things I like to recommend students is that start their day with a mini block of questions. So this could be doing in tutor mode as few as three to five questions. And it kind of gets the brain going and it's a good habit of doing and reviewing questions. You could think of this as your question, your mini question blank, uh, block that goes with your morning coffee. Another thing you could do is to try and review questions that are related to the topic of upcoming lectures in medical school. I imagine almost all of you are in medical school now. So if you do some questions before the lecture, it'll help you sort of focus on what's gonna be covered in the lecture. Um, and that's also gonna help you focus on where you should put your greatest concentration because you'll be, you'll be able to identify your weaknesses before you go to that lecture. Um, many of our tutors and our team recommend their students pick one day per week to retake and review all the questions they got wrong early in the week. I call this wrong question Friday or wrong question Saturday. And this is a great opportunity where you can look for patterns in your mistakes, look for connections between different organ systems and subject areas where you're making mistakes. So it's, again, review, maybe pick one day a week where you review all your wrong questions at the end of the week. So all the one, ones you've done during the week and, and redo them. So I've talked about why to use questions and how to incorporate them, but I also want to show you exactly how, you know, how we, we might extract information from the QBank questions themselves. So here, we've, we have one of our challenge questions that we use in tutoring. This is a question that we developed for our own internal materials at Elite Medical Prep that we use for our tutoring and for our courses. And this question is similar to many of the questions you'll see in UL that have really excellent uh, uh, features to it, and we'll, we'll break it down. So let's look at this one question and see how it can teach us more than just the topic of the correct answer. In prior presentations we've done with UL, we've used this question to demonstrate our four-step approach to questions. And so that four-step approach is as follows. We first, the, first read the last line of the vignette, then we review the answer choices quickly, just sort of identifying patterns in them that help us to, to help us think about where we're going to be thinking about the question. Then we're going to read actively through the vignette and summarize as we go. And generally, we're going to avoid looking at the imaging that's involved because it's, usually we can get the answer just with the text alone. And that's our four-step approach we've, we've covered in some prior webinars. Now, for today, I'm in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to walk you through this question, and I've highlighted some key points that will help point out the key things in this patient case. So. As you can see, this is a middle-aged man, man, he's a 55-year-old gentleman. Um, he has acute onset of bloody diarrhea, so it happened about three hours ago. He has clear signs of cirrhosis and liver failure. The ascites, esophageal varices, spider angioma, this all fits with cirrhosis. Additionally, he has signs that he might be going into shock. His blood pressure is borderline low. And if you look at his heart rate, it looks like his heart rate is elevated, so it's compensating. But importantly, at the same time, his temperature is, is normal. It's not, he's afebrile, so keep all those things in mind. And then of course, if we look at, the, at near the end, we'll see that this patient has a pathology that's involving their small intestine, and, and it's likely ischemic hemorrhagic based on the description, and we'll get, get to that in just a second. So the correct answer here is mesenteric venous thrombosis. And that there are a lot of points that, that, that point out to, and all the clues that I mentioned, the, the, point this diagnosis, the age, the bloody diarrhea, the involvement of the small bowel, um, even the, the signs of cirrhosis, that, that those all point to that. And of course, there's a lack, lack of signs of infection. But before we leave this question, we want to go back and evaluate if there's more that we can learn from it. And, and particularly, what can we learn from the wrong answers in this vignette? So what I'd like to do is like to first categorize the answer types and then come up with a little bit of one-liners for these processes and to sort of to, to see what we can, what additional information we can get from them. So here in this slide, I've shaded the etiologies that are infectious in pink. So we can see I've highlighted three and three answer choices here. We have answer choice C, E, and H. So while all these are infectious, they each have important associations that you should be aware of. So for answer choice C, pseudomembranous colitis. Uh, so, so for, sorry, let me repeat that. For, for in particular of those, we have answer choices C and E, pseudomembranous colitis, and bacterial Enteritis. And these are pretty commonly tested on entities. So these are things you're definitely high yield and you want to know. And we want to be very familiar with. So for example, with pseudomembranous colitis, we need to remember this diffuse colitis. It's caused by C. difficile, and it usually presents several days to weeks after the exposure to antibiotics. It's also characterized with the grayish pseudomembranes and stool, and oftentimes it requires metronidazole and vancomycin for treatment. Bacterial enteritis is another common process and it typically refers to infection in the small bowel. And it, it involves bacteria such as E. coli, Salmonella, or Campylobacter. And sometimes the symptoms are caused by the bacteria themselves, but other times it's caused by the bacteria, by the toxins that these bacteria release. I've also highlighted Whipple disease, which is a much rarer entity, but has classic association of chronic diarrhea, malabsorption, joint pain, and, and joint swelling. 
these these wrong answers are great uh, great entities that you can be used and learn with flashcards. So if you're going to really, if you're not able to memorize those or you don't have the, at the tip of your tongue, make a flashcard on them. And it's a great way to help recall them because they will come up on the test. Now, we can also, just like we did in the last slide, we can also look at the answer choices from a different perspective. We can evaluate them from a standpoint from an anatomic location. So here I've shaded in blue the, the ideologies that, that involve only the colon. Right? And we can just use the name alone to help guide us here. That, that's a strategic method. It's just the naming here. Right? In answer choice B, we have ulcerative colitis. Remember, ulcerative colitis is only going to involve the colon, and in rare cases, it will involve the terminal ilia. But essentially, it is a colonic process of fluid. Likewise, pseudomembranous colitis, which we just covered in the prior slide, is only going to involve, involve the colon, um, especially for the purpose of the test. So from an anatomic standpoint, we can look at these and go, oh, these are colonic only. But if we remember, the the pathology here is involving the small bowel, so we know that we can eliminate these two answer choices. So these are just some of the kinds of associations that we like to make when we, were, when we work with students directly in a one-on-one -on -one fashion, small group fashion, or in our larger courses. And these are the kind of things that an that advanced test taker is going to do as they work through the questions and as they use the QBank to extract the maximum out of each question and out of each explanation. In the interest of time, I want to move on to our discussion, but I remind you, this can really be done with nearly every question you're going to find in the UWorld QBank. Okay, so we've run through a technique on how to approach a step one question, and even you can use this for step two or even step three, but I want to talk to you quickly about the data that you get from the QBank, and, and Dr. Cantola has talked about this as well a little bit earlier, but I just want to emphasize this. Um, in order to think of the QBank as a learning tool, and that's really the way we should be thinking about it, uh, we, want to think it we want to think of it in two passes, a first pass, which is the learning phase, and the second pass. So in the, in the first pass, your the ratio of incorrect answers is going to be higher. You should make sure that you're trying to focus on learning. So don't perseverate on the percent correct and don't be afraid of handling challenging material. Also, don't save questions. This is uh, one thing I learned from Dr. Rubin many, many years ago. This is one of the biggest mistakes students make is to save questions. You are learning from these questions, so don't save them for later. There are tons of questions as, as we'll discuss in the Q&A and um, I'll also cover. And so you have ample opportunity to get lots of additional fresh questions. Also, give yourself enough time to complete this first pass. A good aim is at least five to six months. In fact, many students find that, they, that they'd like to spend even more than that, some closer to 12 months for their first pass. So start even well before they get into their second year of medical school, maybe as early as the beginning of first year of medical school. And this, in order to do this, it requires regularly using the QBank on a near daily basis. Now, when we talk about your second pass, we think, we're gonna think about this as your consolidation phase. This is where you consolidate all that information that you learned in the first pass. And this may usually be done in a shorter time period, two month period that overlaps particularly with your dedicated study period. And here your incorrect ratio should be falling significantly. Additionally, it's key that you start simulating test-like conditions. So you're gonna to wanna to switch from the tutor mode to the time mode and try to use larger blocks of questions up to 40 questions per block. Before I finish up, when we get to our Q&A time, I wanted to briefly point out this chart that sort of explains the evolution of medical student learning styles. So I've been involved in medical education now for about 20 years when I, since when I started medical school in 2002. Um, and so when I started medical school back in 2002, and that feels like a really long time ago now, um, there were students older than me who told me, look, I never use a QBank. And I was, you know, that was, that was fairly, fairly common to hear. Um, but with time, as I was going through medical school and through my MD, PhD program, so I was in school for quite a bit, I heard that it was increasingly clear that a QBank was necessary, but we were told by this, the administration, that really, we only needed to use a QBank during the dedicated study period. But as I finished up my combined MD, PhD in 2009, it was clear from students that they were using QBanks throughout the academic, academic year, but only really after they had learned the topic. So they'd do the lectures or do the reading and then do the questions. And the QBank was sort of a reinforcement tool. But now, and in the last, really the last five to six years, we found that really the QBank is the primary learning tool and should be used in, with material upfront, actually before, you, before you're gonna to get to the lecture and before you get to the passive learning tools. And then use it again as a reinforcement tool throughout to reinforce the learning because it's really the most effective way to learn this large volume of information. And so the modern era of medical education is one where people are doing practice questions as a daily part of their learning and it's something you wanna incorporate into your routine. So at this point, I've finished up my remarks and I, I think we've left enough time for a lot of q and I want to remind you that there's a Q&A feature built into Zoom. So you should use that Q&A to post your question. And I think uh, Kelly Chopra is going to be, is going to be moderating the, the Q&A for us and we'll be able to, both myself, Dr. Cantola and Dr. Rubin will be available to answer your questions live. 
Um, thank you everybody for, for your attention to this point. And I'm gonna switch to the Q&A period. Awesome, thank you so much, um, Dr. Bruce Raymer. Um, all right, so we have started answering some of the questions um, in type form, but we also had marked a few of them as answering live because we felt like they were, uh, we had several coming in that were asking the same thing. Um, so I'll go ahead and um, I will um, read the question and then I will point it um, towards either uh, Dr. Cantola or Dr. Bruce Reamer to answer for us. Um, so on the first one, I'll go with Dr. Cantola. The question is, on the step one, are individual questions timed or the block of 40 questions as a whole time? I was under the impression that a block um, it was done by the block and we would be able to move between questions as we wanted. Yes, um, your, your impression was correct. So it is um, 90 seconds per question averaged out over the block. Um, so if you do a 40 question block, you'll be getting uh, 60 minutes to do that. And then you can use that time, you know, as you need to, as you're answering the question. So a little more here, a little less there, depending on how hard the question is. All right, so let's go to Dr. Bruce Raymer on the next one. Um, and the question is, what do you mean by completing the QBank twice than if there are still unanswered questions? Uh, so ideally, the student is going to complete the QBank a first time, a full complete 100%, and then they're going to go through it a second time, a full 100%. Now, there are uh, situations where, you know, for just for timing or, or whatnot, that they're not going to be able to complete all of it. So then, there, then it becomes a question of, of how, where do you prioritize that? But ideally, you're going to... I answer all of them, and one of the, and in the process of answering all those questions, um, uh, what I like to do is like to again put one day specifically per week where I like to focus on redoing questions that I've gotten wrong. So I've reviewed all those questions, but I want to see have I really acquired that information. So I'll redo them. So that's why I call them redo Fridays. That's my was my habit, um, and I, I hopefully that answers your question with regards to doing the QBank twice. Um, one other additional point is I think it can be done even more than, than twice in some cases. I've heard of students doing something like two and a half times now. Um, really, this is the top one of the top resources you have out there. Thank you so much. All right, uh, let's just, uh, we'll just go back and forth between Dr. Cantola. Um, so we'll be back to Dr. Cantola. Um, are the systems or subjects that have one or more questions higher yield than the subjects that have less questions? or does the number of questions not coincide with the USMLA's exam distribution? Okay, without giving away a proprietary information here, mm -hmm. um, we do try to have our subjects and systems um, overlie the, uh, with the NBME attest. So both, um, if you go to the NBME, NBME website for you know, each of the step exams, they have um, both percentages for each of like the subjects or systems. So, uh, what percent of questions are like on the cardiovascular system versus, you know, a different system. Um, they also have physician competencies, which is, uh, you know, differential diagnosis versus basic science. As you progress through the steps, there'll be, you know, management, things like that. So we pay attention to all of those numbers in calculating the distribution of our questions. So Yes, I think your intuition is right. If there's only like one question in the entire QBank on a particular subject, it's probably not highly tested by the NBME. And things that you see more often are probably those things that you really need to learn. Perfect. Um, and then Dr. Bruce Raymer, we actually have a question specifically um, aligned um, for you. Dr. Bruce Raymer, your slides mentioned that students generally take five to six months for a first pass. Do you know how long students typically take for their second pass? That is a great question. Actually, Dr. Rubin, do you want to also chime in on this as well, or, um, or should, should I go ahead and answer this? Uh, hey, yeah, hey everyone. Sure, I can, I can answer. So the question is, how long does the second pass take? Um, well, so this goes back to a previous question that Dr. Bruschramer addressed. This whole idea of the second pass really makes sense if you're working through the QBank continuously over your second year. That is what we recommend. We recommend starting early. We were very, very high on questions as was covered in this presentation. But the reality is that some students will not really have engaged that much with their QBank until closer to their dedicated study period or maybe even in their dedicated period. 
And so if you are within two months of your exam or six weeks of your exam, it actually is quite challenging to do two full passes through the QBank because now we're talking six, six to 8,000 questions. So if someone has done QBank throughout second year, then a second pass could be during their dedicated period, which could be four to six weeks. But if someone has really only done their first pass or started their first pass close to their dedicated period, and they only have a couple of weeks at the end of their study period to do more questions, then really your only option is a modified second pass that focuses on marked questions and incorrect questions. You likely will not have time to do a full second pass while also doing an BME practice exams and doing whatever other flashcards or types of review that you want to do going into your exam. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Rubin. All right, I am actually, I'm gonna answer one question um, just really quickly. And the question is, does the mobile app and the browser systems work together? I got a warning message in app on my phone once made me think it might erase all of my notes that I was working on from my laptop. Um, all of our programs are synergistic. So if you start on your phone and then you move to your laptop, um, you can use them um, all, all in the same. It should just pick up where you left off and it should never erase any notes or flashcards based on where you're logging in from. All right, okay. So the next question is a little bit of um, a two-part question, but I'm gonna aim it at Dr. Kentola. And it is, I am about to complete my first pass of UWorld. For the second pass, I was planning to do wrong and marked questions. Should I target the whole UWorld questions again, or is it okay to just do the wrong ones and marked? But then in addition to that, if, if the school does not have a dedicated study time, how would you go about doing that second pass through it? And so I think this, this could be a combined question. Sure, um, <clears throat> I'll kind of answer this. And then also, I don't know if um, Dr. Bruce Raymer or Dr. Rubin want to answer it as well. Um, so first of all, I just want to say congrats on getting through your first pass, because I know that takes a lot of dedication and work to do that in the first place. Um, so getting a really good first pass um, is super important. So I wouldn't try to like rush just to get through two passes. Like I would make sure I do a really solid first pass. I'm just kind of, you know, saying that more generally. Um, and then really it depends on how much time you have left. I do think a strategy, if you're really short on time, is to do your marked in incorrect. Like when you're thinking about triaging, um, that's good. If you do have time to squeeze in a full second pass, right, that's probably better. But you kind of know what amount of time you have and like what you can even handle mentally. And so, um, you know, there's the idealist and the realist. And, and so I think if you are short on time, that marked and incorrect strategy is really good. Um, for students that don't have a dedicated study time, um, you know, I think you just have to kind of, kind of begin with the end in mind, like how can you carve out um, something that sort of approximates a dedicated study time? And obviously that means you, if you don't have it given by your school, you're probably not gonna have eight to 12 hours a day to study. So you may wanna kind of complete that first pass earlier so that you know even if you only have sort of two to three hours a day or whatever to study in your pseudo dedicated study time, um, you, have, you start that earlier. So you have cumulatively more time over a longer period to, to kind of work through um, what you can make time for, whether that's a full second pass or whether that's marked and incorrect questions. Great, thank you so much. All right, um, Dr. Bruce Raymer, Dr. Uh, Rubin, I think that you guys would be uh, really good to answer these um, next two questions. I'm gonna uh, combine them. I'm an older IMG, should I jump right into the questions or do I require reviews such as videos and books? And then a step further is which part of the day is most effective in doing test blocks? So I think these are, are great questions and uh... You know, there, well, the answer that I'll give, I think, will apply to a bit of what um, uh, other people are, are maybe thinking as well. So for the person who's the older IMG or maybe somebody who's just stopped doing medical school for whatever reason or stopped their studies for whatever reason, and you want to jump back in, there's this temptation to say, oh, I need to go back and I need to sit down with the review books and relearn everything by rereading it. And only then I'll get to the questions. And I think that that, that temptation is actually, for the science, is incorrect. 
really you want to be as efficient as possible with your learning. And the most efficient way to do that is to jump in and start doing questions. It is going to feel more challenging and more difficult and more uncomfortable, but ultimately your, 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 the effectiveness of your studying is going to be far more efficient because what's going to happen is you're going to quickly identify where your weaknesses are and you're going to quickly identify where you need to spend your time reading. This is a theme that I'm going to cover now with re re regards to the second question. And I know Dr. Rubin has additional thoughts on this. And the question is, the question one question was, when is the most effective part of the day to do question books? And this is something that we've evolved on. I used to say, do your reading, do your reviewing, maybe watch your videos, and then do your questions. Now I firmly believe in the opposite. Do your questions first. It's been shown that your greatest energy and greatest concentration is in the morning. So you want to do your most, your most effective, most efficient activities in the morning, the, the things that require the most mental energy in the morning. What's going to require the most mental energy? What's going to give you the best bang for your buck in terms of time? That's going to be doing questions. So you should actually start your day with questions and then the question review and maybe some flashcards and then spend a the latter part of your day when you're near low doing reading and reviewing a, a path with, with passive resources. Maybe Dr. Rubin, you have some additional thoughts on this? Yeah, I, this is, these are great questions, and I 100% agree with everything that Dr. Bershamer just said. And this is the result of many years of reflection and working with students and seeing what, what works and talking to our tutors. And it can seem counterintuitive, but it's 100% agree. And just a little more commentary on that. One of the best ways that you feel productive as a student is by doing questions and also by doing flashcards. One of the ways that you set yourself up to maybe feel unproductive is by watching hours and hours of video or by reading long blocks of text. And when you feel not productive, that adds to your anxiety, which totally can destroy your productivity and your outlook as, as a student. Conversely, when you do something and you feel productive, oh, I just did this block of questions. I got through these 100 flashcards. You feel a burst of energy. You feel better about yourself. And that can make you more productive over the rest of the day. So it's good to do these things that you can check off the list earlier in the day because that sets you up for greater productivity in the second half of your study day. In terms of the other question about uh, how an IMG should approach things, some of you who are listening to this might be thinking, okay, this, this all sounds well and good, but there's no way that someone who's been out of the game for five years, 10 years, they just, they haven't studied this material in a while. There's no way that, that they're gonna be able to get as much from the questions and move as quickly as someone who has just gone through M1 and M2 of medical school, and you're thinking that you're totally right. But what you want, what the difference is, is likely going to be the amount of time it takes the, the student who is a little out of it to get through everything. So maybe it's going to take that student twice as long or more than twice as long to go through the, the questions and to look up the information and maybe even to seek out a video or two that expands on the information. It will take longer. It will be more painful. It will be more cumbersome, but it doesn't mean that that is not still the right way to do it. Meaning focusing on questions, building your studying around questions. We strongly feel this is the right approach for every student at every level of any background. It's just a question of how you customize the question-based studying approach for each student based on their specific circumstances. Great. All right. Uh, the next question is, are there OMM questions within UWorld? My school got a UWorld subscription for us. So in the last year, we do actually have an OMM, uh, OMM and, or OMT and OPP supplement. Um, and so, uh, Sarah, depending on which um, subscription your school purchased you, they may be added. And so if you were to have this um, subscription, which is called our Comlex 1 or our Comlex 2 subscription, um, underneath the subjects in the bottom right-hand corner, you would actually see where those subjects are actually split out. Um, again, we'll type my information in here. If you have any questions, um, you can reach out to me. If they're not included, there is a way to get them added on uh, so we can discuss that as well. That's a great question. Um, all right. Um, the next one um, I will actually um, share with uh, Dr. Cantola. And I have heard UWorld is among the most challenging difficulty for questions. Would you say that is true? If so, is that intentional so that students are over prepared for, for test day? Um, I feel like you, you just like set me up with that wonderful question. Yeah, we try to make our questions um, at or above the difficulty level of the NBME exams. Um, and so 
I think traditionally of all the Q banks that are out there, ours have been considered the most challenging. Um, and yes, we do that um, so that you are overprepared for the exam. The other thing I'll say is, you know, our um, particular interface um, has the ability to simulate the exam. So not just in like taking 40 question blocks and in the sim exams and all of that, but we designed our program so that you can select the NBME interface. Um, and so when students have taken really challenging questions in 40 question blocks using the NBME step one simulation interface, um, they often will go to their test day and then give us feedback where they're like, hey, it just felt like doing another UWorld practice test. Um, and so we've designed that to try to take out some of the stress um, by just making it more familiar, help, helping you build your confidence. Um, and so because of that, I had seen a question about sort of, you know, what is a score for passing? Uh, I'm just going to kind of touch on that uh, really quick. Um, things are a little bit in flux since they've made step one pass fail. Um, we don't know exactly if they're going to make it a little bit more like raise the bar on what the threshold's going to be for passing. But traditionally over the years, um, if you're getting 40% or more correct in the step one Q bank, that typically correlated with a passing score. So I'm just going to throw that number out there. We're going to have to wait and see, you know, um, over the next year or two um, as the NBME makes changes. But um, I just wanted to kind of hit that question since I saw it as well. Perfect. All right, um, we have um, about four more minutes, so we'll try to get a few more questions in. Uh, but maybe uh, Dr. Rubin would like to answer this one. As a student from India, where the materials are different than the USMLE and a lot of time constraints, who do you recommend to do college lectures and invest that time doing? The, would you? suggest skipping college lectures and invest that time doing the question bank instead. Yeah, no, what, so we talked about this a little bit before and I, I think the um, answer is not gonna be surprising based on the discussion, which is yes, I, I would recommend skipping the lectures and focusing on the questions, especially because the style and content of the Indian, the way, of the, way the material is taught in India, if it's different, then immediately you need to start training yourself on the American style content. And there's no better way to train yourself on the way these questions are asked, the content that's high yield, content that step one is going to focus on. There's no better way to do that than through a very high quality cubing like UWorld. And it can be a bit of a trial and error process where you feel really confident about a question. You think the answer is A because that's how you learned it, but then the answer is actually C because American medicine is different. And that's gonna make your percentages lower, but who cares? This is, UWorld is your, is your training simulation. It's your training tool. It doesn't matter what the percentages are. All that matters is that you're learning effectively and we'll be able to apply what you're learning first to the practice assessments, for example, in BMEs, and then ultimately to the exam itself. So it, we may seem a little repetitive in our answers, but there, um, there really is no better way to, to, to start a, a training yourself for, for U.S. assembly standards than to work from a, a tool like UWorld. Perfect, thanks so much. All right, uh, the next one um, I am actually gonna go to Dr. Cantola on. Um, when should I take the self-assessments? First pass, second pass, or near the exam? Um, so um, my thought on this is that I would take the self-assessment um, in more of an exam simulation style. So I probably wouldn't use it in my first pass. Um, I would just, you know, there's 3,600, you know, plus questions to get through in the first pass. I would use it during my second pass, um, which typically corresponds with dedicated study time. I would take one of them very early on in that dedicated study time. Um, and I would take it like I wouldn't just take part of the simulation exam one day and part of it the next, I would actually sit down and do all four question blocks um, simulating the exam. So, you know, with the same amount of time you might have for breaks. Um, and then your brain will probably be shot. You'll probably want to spend the next day reading those explanations, but do read those explanations. So use it both as um, an exam simulation, but also as additional learning. It's going to give you some diagnostics um, that are going to be separate, right, from the initial Q bank. So, that's gonna help you as you enter your dedicated study time, just to have a little bit more um, diagnostics about what's your strengths and what are your weaknesses. And then I would do another one, maybe about two thirds of the way through. And then there are also other 
um, simulation exams that are out there, like the NBME forms, to intersperse in there. Um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Bruce Raymer or Dr. Rubin, you want to contribute to the, uh, to that particular discussion, but I think not saving them all is like a pretty important um, thing to say. Yeah, I, I, I could just jump in. I totally agree with, with the comments that were just made. And, and I think we may have addressed this also in the, the chat, which is to say that uh, UWorld assessments are probably better in the second half of the study period. It's good protocol for any standardized exam. This could be for USMLE or SATs or whatever exam, MCAT, to take a test up front as a baseline and then to also take an exam may maybe seven to 10 days before the real exam, take an assessment seven days before to see where you, where you are and whether you're on track to meet your goals. NBMEs are great for, for these bookends, for that first one and for the last one, because no one has as much data as they do about um, uh, correlating performance on the NBME to performance on the real exam, especially with all the flux that's created by the recent pass-fail change. Now, UWorld assessments have always been absolutely key in the study plans that we make for our, for our own tutoring students. We always love the assessments because they're so well put together. They're kind of flagship presentations of questions from our perspective. And also, they have great explanations, which are very useful for learning purposes. So they're great to do. They're essential to do. Um, but more so for more practice in a test like situation using, using the real test uh, software and interface. And also you want to take them when you have an opportunity to learn. So you don't want to take them too close to your exam when maybe you're not able to really settle down and spend the hours you need to review it. But maybe like the last couple of weeks before the last I don't know, two, three weeks before an exam uh, for a real exam, they can be very good to, to do. But you should not skimp on them. Even with six NBMEs out there, there's still tremendous learning value in these assessments. So you definitely should build them in more likely in the second half of your study period. Yeah, I, I might add just quickly, um, I've spoken to some of, the, some of the other members of the UWorld team that have developed these and the, the level of, of rigor, the statistical rigor that's applied to their formulation of these, these tests is incredible. There's really a big team that's involved in this. this is, they really take it very seriously. And we're talking about step one and, and it obviously these are great tools, but for step two, the UWorld self-assessments are even more important uh, and even more valuable. And I know that that's not necessarily a discussion for today, but but these these have become really a core part of the learning process and evaluation, self-evaluation process. All right. Um, okay, a couple a couple more minutes to answer a couple questions. One of the questions that we got and we get it frequently is, when will we have when we have the opportunity to use UWorld without Wi-Fi on our devices? Sometimes on the go, we don't have good signal and can't study. So the actual creating of a test on its own cannot be done offline. And that the reason is, is because we're consistently updating um, information and the questions and things of that nature. You would literally have to do five to six updates per day um, on your phone. But what you should and can utilize um, offline are your flashcard decks that you've created and your electronic notebook. Um, and so those things should be able to be utilized offline. All right, these are really good questions. So we've got a couple more minutes um, to go through some questions. Um, a lot of them are, are questions that we've actually gone through a little bit. Um, this is a good one and um, Marcel, maybe I'll, I'll hand this one to you. Uh, good afternoon. How would you suggest studying if you hadn't done the QBank throughout the second year? My school had only suggested doing these questions after second year. I don't have much time as I hope to do clinicals in the early months of next year. This is, this is really, unfortunately, this is all too common uh, a situation where we have students who've gotten advice from their school or from maybe from other students um, not to spend too much time with, with the QBank um, during you know, earlier in their academic year and uh, their academic career. And of course, that, that's a problem. You know, the time has passed. So you have to figure out what to do now. So really, this, in these situations, this becomes sort of really student specific. Obviously, you're going to want to do as many questions as you're able to do. But you, you want to also make sure that every question you're doing, you have time to review them. So it's not simply a, 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 a situation where you just cram through as many questions as possible and then re barely review them. So you're going to have to be a little bit more selective. And I think for a student, for a student like yourself, 
maybe the first thing is to figure out where your weak spots are and then use, so first use maybe a U-World self-assessment to assess where your weak areas are and then use the QBank as a tool to shore up your weak areas. Much like, uh, you know, professional athletes, basketball players who can't dribble with their left hand, they'll practice with their, they'll practice dribbling with their left hand. You want to do the same thing. You're going to focus on your weakest spots and try to shore those up. And that might be a, sort of a broad uh, way to approach that. But if you're really looking for more specific help, you may want to engage work with uh, work with a, with a specialized tutor. Um, these are the kind of situations we deal with where students have sort of unusual situations and really need help in, in a crisis period, uh, you know, a short period of time. Perfect. All right. Um, and so I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items um, very quickly. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions on whether all of you will get a recording of the webinar. You will get a recording um, email update today. It will also have our contact information. So if you have any follow up questions um, that you didn't have a chance to ask today, you are more than welcome to reach out um, to that contact information. Uh, we want to thank all of you for your time today. We know that it is precious and we feel really honored that you spent it with us. Um, thank you to Elite Medical Prep, Dr. Bruce Raymer and Dr. Rubin for spending time with us, Dr. Cantola. Um, and we hope that you all have um, a lovely rest of your day. Thank you so much.